Thank you, Your Excellency, and thank you for that um, encouragement, I guess, because I look at the situation and sometimes feel like, why are we not there yet? So I want to turn to Her Excellency uh, Stella. Where do you think we are? And where are the gaps in implementation? What advice would you have? Thank you uh, so much for giving me the floor. First of all, uh, of course, uh, good afternoon to all of you in Dubai. I really wish I could have been there with you, but um, hopefully we can still do that in the not uh, too distant future. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, where do we stand uh, on, uh, on particularly SDG 5? I would say on that that it is really important to say that uh, if we have one major achievement, it is really that we have today a very strong normative and conceptual framework mm -hmm. in place. We have, I think you all of, all of you uh, know that we have the Istanbul Convention, we have several other important instruments, human rights uh, charters, and in the EU, particularly, we have what we call in jargon a little bit uh, gap three, the, the gender action plan three. And this really provides us with a very robust policy framework. So uh, with that, I mean, it guides our external action, but it also lays down what we want to achieve internally. For instance, in 2025, we want to have 50% uh, female managers. Um, so what I want to say with that is that what I think has gone well over the past, well, years or, or even a decade is the building up of this, uh, what I would call the so-called infrastructure. Uh, however, now comes the hard part uh, uh, because all of this, what we have needs to be implemented. Uh, and, uh, of course, what, uh, what one often hears in this regard is we now need to mainstream gender aspects into our work. Um, gender and diversity, uh, I would say, really need now to cease to be um, an afterthought in the things that we do. Or, in other words, you know, it, seeks, it needs to cease to be a separate agenda item. And it would rather have to be a reflex, something that we automatically think of as we go about our business. And this is, I think, the part where it really uh, gets and where it has gotten uh, more complicated. Um, so um, we haven't achieved gender equality yet. Uh, neither in our organizations nor in our external actions or in our diplomacy for that matter. And I safely, I think that we can safely conclude now that it means that it doesn't change by itself. Mm. It doesn't change in a voluntary way. Uh, and we now know that much more is needed. Thank you. I don't know Thank if you, you want to. Yeah. Thank you, Your Excellency. <laughs> I think uh, I want to give um, the floor to Her Excellency Sonia because I think I want to hear your overview before we get to the hard questions of why this is still not what we know what to do, what still needs to be done. And we're going to explore that after Her Excellency Sonia gives us her overview. Yeah. I mean, I think I would have to say that in answer to where are we, we're not anywhere near we need to be, where we need to be. Mm. So I agree, obviously, with Stella that there's a good normative framework internationally. Um, of course, I agree as well with, with uh, Epsi, the Vice President, that there's more of a coalition of people now who are interested in this, but we're still far away from where we need to be. And one of the things I think is most striking about SDG 5 and the pandemic is that we're now um, 36 years behind gender equality, where in comparison to where we were two years ago. Yeah. So the World Economic Forum has sort of measured that and basically said we now need another 36 years to catch up with the last two years because we've actually lost a lot of the gains that we had made up until then. Because until COVID, we had, in general, a positive trajectory on SDG 5. We still weren't where we needed to be, but we were going in the right direction. 
but things like particularly girls' education has really been pushed back. Um, things like, for instance, women's participation in the workforce and women's economic empowerment has been really pushed back by the pandemic. So we have to work extra hard um, to get to where we want to be in 2030. I totally agree that we can get there, but we can't get there without an enormous effort and really doubling down on the efforts that we've made so far. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to go back to you, Your Excellency Stella, and you talked about the, we have a really strong framework. We have had that on our tables for years. We started with Beijing. We made sure that even the um, Addis uh, framework for action, the, the, the Addis Ababa uh, action framework, which came right before the adoption of the SDGs and, and sort of outlined the investments we need to take was gender responsive. SDG 5 stood alone as an SDG, but was also mainstreamed across the rest of the SDGs, at least 14 of them. Um, most of our organizations are now cognizant of the need to mainstream. We've talked about gender responsive budgeting, and I'm, I'm going to ask you, Your uh, Excellency, to talk about that in a minute. We at the Women's Pavilion, when we created the space, we felt, okay, we know what needs to be done. We have all of these frameworks, and yet something keeps missing. We boiled it down to this idea that it is gender norms, social norms, negative stereotypes. It's a flawed <laughs> way of thinking, if I may be so bold and honest with you all, right? That still holds us back. Would you agree with this? What is it? Is it a lack of political will, lack of investment, lack of, or perhaps all of the above? But to us, at least, it was a, a negative understanding of gender roles, stereotypes, and, uh, you know, unconscious biases, really, that, that we felt perhaps we, this is the thing that we could deal with here. What would you say to that? You, you have asked, yeah, you, you've given me the floor, right? Um, yes. uh, well, I um, uh, obviously, um, uh, a lot of what you've said is, is all coming into play. And I think that is exactly where things are uh, getting so complicated because we are really talking about a combination of things indeed. Uh, I would like to start, though, with saying that for me, it is crystal clear that if there is one thing that is needed and that has not been sufficiently the case over the past years and over the past decades, is really that we, I think, all know by now that um, a gender equality needs to be supported or even, um, uh, if you will, imposed by the top leadership of organizations, of institutions and companies, the private sector for that matter. Uh, um, and I, I, I think that uh, uh, we have one clear example there, and that is the United Nations with the Secretary General that has really uh, for years uh, insisted on that this now needs to be done uh, using also, and I think that's extremely important, very consistent and deliberate policies, including temporary special measures that really have uh, uh, changed things. Um, that, I would say, also leads me to say that if there is one thing that we now feel, that I now feel in my uh, daily job that I'm doing is extremely important, is really the concept of gender responsive leadership. What we feel has been missing for, uh, well, quite some time. Uh, the EAS, of course, is not a very old institution. But uh, what we are working on almost, I would say, as we speak, is really the introduction, both internally and externally, of gender responsive leadership. Uh, we need to look at ways how we can... Um, uh, in, instill this idea of gender responsive, gender responsive leadership 
in all our leaders and managers and how we can hold them accountable for this, which also means, of course, that then they need to be given the tools and the training to live up to the commitments. Um, I would like to come back later to your mentioning of, of unconscious bias, because I think that's a whole separate uh, part. But I really think it's also very important to look at this issue of gender responsive leadership. Mm. And we have a world leader, um, Her Excellency, the Vice President of Costa Rica, was, uh, you know, uh, one of the first women to hold such a such a position on the uh, American continent, I should say, and uh, she is somebody I think who has espoused quite naturally your work with women's organization, your work on the ground demonstrate that demonstrates this commitment. And I think uh, um, naturally, perhaps, gender responsive leadership was a natural thing. Would you, could you elaborate on this idea and how that informs your policies and drives and how critical do you think it is? In, in Costa Rica, we have um, a general law in terms of parity. Um, women participation in the in in position political position, especially in the parliament. Now we have the 46 percent of women seats in the parliament, but also we have a parity government. And but we have a lot of years since 90s that we work a lot as women movement with women in political position to make a big framework mm. to work with the issue of women. Mm. But it's true that the pandemic of COVID-19 um, let us naked all over the world. Mm. Because if we think in terms of the economical participation of women, um, if we think about the double work with women in the, in the house and also in, in their formal works, but also most of the, of the people that is in the informal economy are women, then it is natural for those we are work um, in the past in terms of of um, women participation, fight um, uh, of, um, about the human rights, to put that kind of view in our work when we have leader position, yes. governmental position. But also, I'm part of the, of, of the cabinet of the Presidente Carlos Alvarado, and he's a young man, commit with gender issues, mm -hmm. commit with um, women's participation, because we don't have any law about parity in the cabinet, but he, he, by his decision, also because they have um, leaders like me, but but him decision, we have a parity mm -hmm. cabinet. And also we have a policy in terms of empower, economy empowerment of women. If we are involved in the, in the field with women issues, it's more easy mm -hmm. to put that kind of commit when we have political position. And, um, but that is not enough. That is not enough. We need to make stronger, stronger um, changes because budget, because we have to, to see the budget, how we use the budget as a tool to make equal rights between men and women. Mm -hmm. And that has to be with a very big group of people taking decision. We have to de deal with the parliament, we have to deal with the minister of a specific areas, we have to deal with uh, the international view 
of the international organization as um, um, the, the um, Fondo Monetario Internacional, IMF. 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 Mm. <laughs> and uh, that, uh, the, the World Bank, etc. they don't have already a view to involve the gender perspective mm. in all the development programs. And uh, I, I think that women that know that have to do double work mm. because we have to convince every day more people to, to engage with the women issues and to put in the specific activities in the mm. programs, in the policies, that kind of views. Absolutely, absolutely. And so thank you for doing that. And I think voices like yours are so necessary um, to, to help us make this a natural practice, right? It's not, we're not there yet. Not every country follows gender responsive budgeting and uh, mainstreaming. Um, so thank you. Uh, I, I want to move on to uh, Ambassador Highland. We've, we talked about this a little bit before. We talked mm -hmm. about Ireland's role in women, peace, and security. Um, how has that experience, your leadership on that, mm -hmm. how has the, your role in the women, peace, and security agenda um, given you perhaps ideas mm -hmm on uh, how we mainstream gender in the best way, how we make sure that SDG 5 is really that SDG that unlocks everything else. And, and that link between development and security has to be there. So please tell us about Ireland's experience in that. Sure. So I guess, I mean, we ha I suppose two things about Ireland that are important in this um, conversation. One is that we were the co-chair of the SDGs. So we were sort of, I guess, along with Kenya, I guess the midwife or the midwives of the SDGs. So when the SDGs were being discussed and debated at, at the UN with all of the 100 93 member states around the table. It was the Kenyan and, and the Irish ambassadors at the time that, that pulled it all together. And I think within all of the 17 SDGs, they're all indivisible. I mean, none of them can be met without meeting others. But I think SDG 5 is particularly an absolutely important catalytic SDG. You can't meet the health, uh, education, uh, e equality, um, you name it. You cannot meet any of the goals without gender equality. So it's one of the big drivers, one of the goals that's, I suppose, most important as a catalytic goal to, to push through other goals. And as you said, also for us, women, peace and security is a huge part of our foreign policy agenda and also our, our national agenda. And one of the reasons for that and one of the reasons that we have at the moment, as a member of the UN Security Council, paid so much attention to women, peace and security and put it at the top of our agenda, is because in Ireland we had our own conflict and our own peace process. So the Good Friday Agreement, which is the peace process uh, that was signed in 1998 in Northern Ireland, is something that we worked on for, for decades and we're still 20 something years later, still implementing it. It's still not done, you know, we're still in the middle of implementation. And what we've learned from our own experience of conflict on the island of Ireland is that if you don't include women, you're not going to have sustainable peace. And there's so much evidence of that everywhere. And so, you, you know, you ask me, how do we, you know, how do we make sure that women are, are participating? How do we make sure that women are, are um, included and part of the decision making and at the table? I think we just rely on demonstrating the evidence and the evidence is you can't achieve prosperity you can't achieve peace you can't achieve sustainable development you can't achieve any of your goals without gender equality at the heart of it i think what's frustrating in a way is that we keep having to repeat this yes and again that covid we thought we were making progress and that the first thing that covid has affected almost is is gender equality so that as soon as we come into a really significant pandemic and a global challenge 
you know, it's women's participation that, that, that f is the first thing to suffer in a way. And of course, many people have suffered. It's not just women that have suffered, but women have disproportionately um, uh, been affected by the, by the pandemic. But I think we just have to keep going back to the evidence, um, whether it's in business, whether it's mm. in government, whether it's in um, conflict and security, whether it's in development and social and economic um, aims. You just can't do it without women. And I think in a way you were saying earlier about the women's pavilion that you have to explain to people as they come you know, why we're focusing on women. I almost think we should just turn that question around and say to people, but what do you think you're going to achieve without 50% of the world's population? You know, sometimes it's almost, I remember talking to an Irish business person, businessman, and he had a board of 10 people, one of whom was women, one of whom was a woman, and nine of whom were men. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, yeah, we're trying to get more, you know, women and, you know, ethnically diverse, more minorities. And I said, well, you're the minority. <laughs> you're a white man. You're actually a minority. Um, you know, you've got nine people who are a minority on your board. So actually, I, well, my question to you is not, aren't you great to get like one extra woman or one person of color? But why on earth are you relying on a minority of the human population for 90% of your board? Are you not interested in talent? Are you not interested in maximizing, you know, your profitability and your talent? Because you're not using talent. So I think we need to turn the conversation in a way, not as a favor, please allow us in because we're yes, women yes, or people yes, of yes, color, yes, yes, yes. but to say, well, actually, we're the majority. So at the moment, white men have an outsized economic and political power, but that's a historical quirk that doesn't mm -hmm. match with, mm -hmm. you know, statistically with talent and with opportunity. Yeah, or the, the, the makeup of our world. Exactly, right? exactly. So I know you have to, something to say about that. No, please. no, yes. <laughs> when, when I hear you, I think that that is so necessary to understand mm. the the issue about what we are lose if we don't work with gender perspective, mm. because we are lose a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and also, I think that we we need a kind of network of men working with the with the goal five of SDGs, mm -hmm. because there is necessary to be part of all the agenda, mm. all the agenda. Uh, and most of the, the um, leaders see only the, the, the goal five yeah. as a goal for women, mm. and the others is the, the goal for, for the world without women, I think. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, this is, this is the, 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 new, the new way the way is how the, the goal five hmm. is the perspective to see the whole agenda of the SDGs hmm. and how men, men want to work with, with the, 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 the goal five if we want to achieve the whole agenda. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. I'm going to go back to Your Excellency Stella. Um, do you think that we are closer to this point of view, to, to that inclusive, to you know, women's issues are everybody's issues? Um, by adopting, we see now, you know, more and more governments adopting feminist foreign policies. Uh -huh. Do you think we are closer? <laughs> When we, when we adopt a feminist foreign policy, and please tell us what, it, what are its characteristics and how do you think it influences uh, uh, the tackling of the SDGs? Thank you. Um, first of all, if I may, one comment uh, uh, connected to the discussion just now. Uh, I please. think what is also very important, and it was touched upon, but it, I would like to underline, the importance that actually men are more included in uh, in our discussions. I mean, also in this discussion, if you will, because um, I also do think that sometimes the focus has been too much on uh, women talking about this and the men, you know, waiting for us to see how far we can get. Uh, so they, they definitely must be included uh, in our discussions. And I'm also saying that because... Um, what is extremely important to keep in mind with what we are trying to do and what we are discussing today mm -hmm. is the fact that basically we really are trying to have 
uh, to establish and to bring about a huge organizational and structural and societal change. I mean, we basically have for centuries uh, been living how we have been living. And this all needs to change now. And every change, as we know, meets with resistance. And I think that is really where we are at this point. We, we are meeting this resistance and it needs to be overcome. And that is that is very, really where it gets very hard and that is where it gets painstaking and difficult. And that is also, I'm also saying it because that to me is why we really need deliberate instruments. Okay, mm. so, so on the feminist foreign policy, um, on that I would like to say that in my view, uh, uh, that notion, the feminist foreign policy, is really understood differently by different people. Um, it can on the one hand be seen as you know, our foreign policy that needs to be done differently um, by having more attention on what effect and impact our external action uh, has on women and girls. Mm -hmm. At the same time, mm -hmm. one can also take the approach that we simply need more women in critical positions, uh, including in, in, in leadership and management, in order to change things from within. Yep. Uh, we are already, in a way, doing this because we have this, this gap strategy. Uh, and, um, well, to cut a long story short, but there is so much to say about this. And as you can see, I get uh, very um, <laughs> inspired when I start to talk about it. But what really matters, uh, in my view, is that we, that we do these changes and then at the end of the day, to me, it doesn't really matter so much what label you stick to it. Mm -hmm. It matters what we achieve. And I am uh, 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 not convinced that the label as such will make the change. You know, it's really what we do. Um, so, so that would be my uh, response to your question. Thank you. I, I, sometimes, you know, the labels have a tendency to drive us even further away from each other, you know, and when we're really just trying to say that there has to be inclusion and inclusion doesn't just only mean that women are included it's men it's the youth as you were saying your excellency in the beginning it's that it's everybody's business mm -hmm. and i think for us here at the women's pavilion you know we wanted to demonstrate that very early on you know our pavilion is in partnership or collaboration i say with, with cartier Cartier is not the first name that pops up in your yes. mind when you think about gender equality, but it's a testament to our approach of building multi-stakeholder spaces and saying that even if you're a luxury brand, you still have a stake in this. Mm. You know, this is not a poor woman's issue. This is everybody's issue, wherever social scale you sit in. And um, yeah, so, so I, I fully agree. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, so I want to go back to that original question I had, which is um, the question of social norms, the question of stereotypes. How do you think we could address that best? And please, I'll start with you, Vice President. I think that um, one of the, um, the, the forms that we have to deal with stereotypes is um, education. Mm -hmm. Education. But the education in all the forms. I think education in the, um, in the media. I, when I think in education, I think education not only in the schools, but in the works. In, the in storytelling? In, in sto yes, yes. Could you please tell us about <laughs> that? <laughs> and because this is the only way to change mind. Mm. It, most of the people now use um, the, the social um, interacts mm -hmm. by internet in any forms. And if we, if we think 
about stereotypes, we have to work there, exactly there, and put money there, because we have to change the minds, not only of the, of the Joan people, but all the people in the yeah. society. Absolutely. We have to, to work in terms of the private sector, if we think in education, to fight against stereotypes. Mm -hmm. We have to think in terms of quotas, but quota, a loss of quotas not only in the government, but also in the private sector. Because we have a lot of experience mm -hmm. about what means when, when the women are in leader position mm -hmm. in the private sector. Mm -hmm. That one way to fight against stereotype, but also to change the, the roles, the traditional roles in the house. That, that means work in terms of stereotypes. And that means a, a, a large change in all the forms that we have relation between us, men and women. And uh, it is so important that more, more men talk about women issues because that means change stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Not only m women have to talk about women issues because women issues are development issues. If we have more men, and I think that the UN and in the international organization and the Expo and this kind of experience of this pavilion open their minds of the people to think different in terms of, of the, the stereotypes not only stereotypes of women, also the stereotypes of man. What means being a man in, the, in this society? What means being a woman? And we have to work in a different way, mm. in a different way. Thinking about men and, and women could be everything. I think, I see, I, I, I say everything, everything is everything in the, in the society. If we have more women making different things, we are working in stereotypes. If we, if we see more men making women work, mm -hmm. we are working to change the stereotypes more men deal with the, their, their children, more men clean in their house, mm -hmm. more men make the traditional work of women. We are deal with, with the stereotypes. Absolutely. And I can't wait for you to see the pavilion. <laughs> I think you're really going to like it. I want to go out on a limb here and ask um, Her Excellency Stella, do you think you were talking about the importance of normative frameworks? Do you think that we need a framework that tells us how to tackle stereotypes? Is that even possible? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a very hard question. <laughs> I wish I had a straight answer to that. Uh, because, yeah, in, I mean, that's why I thought it was interesting to come back to this, because, of course, the, the stereotypes and the biases, this is such a hard nut to crack, you know. This is really, as, as, uh, as one can, can put it, this is what is our hard disk, right? This is how we are wired. Yeah. And we don't really know much about how that works so let alone that we already know concretely how to go about it i do think though um that uh, what we have learned over the the past few maybe years is is that there are sort of simple um tools that we can work with like uh you know having people apply anonymously for uh, certain positions so that indeed certain biases can simply not come into play or um, even I, I, I was reading about the New York Phil Philharmonic Orchestra that until a few uh, uh, sorry uh, decades ago did not, not have any female 
uh, musicians until they started to have um, uh, invisible uh, uh, performance. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Blind auditions, that's the word. So, so there are things that we can do. And, and I mean, to sort of give a positive note to this, even though, as I said, I mean, this is really a very tough one. But so I entered the diplomatic service in 1990 together with just really a few, a very small group of, of women in my diplomatic training. But today we are talking about this. And today you are asking, you are sitting in Dubai, you're asking me sitting in Brussels about uh, uh, unconscious bias and perhaps... That by itself, you know, is the biggest progress that we have made. It's on the table. Mm. We're talking about it. And I, I really do think that by now there are not many people who wouldn't know anymore what we mean when we talk about unconscious biases. So at least I think what we are what we are working on now is we're, we're making our, ourselves and everybody conscious of yeah. the biases. But okay, this is indeed only halfway, I'm sorry to say. No, you're absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, I mean, I your think thoughts. Yeah, stereotypes and, and, and um, sort of traditional or, or stereotyped roles. I mean, I agree with everything that the vice president said and also that Stella said, but I also think we do need to keep coming back to structures and legislation oh, and yes. normative mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it can get a bit... I, I worry sometimes that if we move into only talking about things like stereotypes mm -hmm. and gender roles, mm -hmm. that we lose sight of the fact that there are many countries in the world where when women don't have even the basic legislative rights um, that they need. There are lots of countries in the world that women, for instance, don't have the same mm -hmm. access to inheriting land or inheriting property or, or assets. There's lots of countries in the world where women don't have the same rights in relation to equal pay or even access to the workforce, maternity leave, um, laws against, against discrimination mm -hmm. on you know, the grounds of maternity or, or gender. So I think that we, we have to do both. We can't, we can't stop uh, focusing on structural, legislative issues of hard power and access mm. to money and power, mm. but we also have to come at it also from the attitudinal, cultural, uh, and stereotype side. So it's a, it's a pincer movement. You have to do both. Yeah, absolutely. And I wish there was some kind of booklet or guide or how-to mm. on how to tackle <laughs> all of these unconscious biases, like all of the examples that you said, blind auditions for orchestras. You know, yeah. we, we need to collect all of these best practices, let's say, and make them part of the way we run things daily. I, I think that, that also we need, we need laws. We mm. still need, need laws. We still need um, parity laws. Mm. In, in the government, in the, um, in the political decision making. We still need, and we have to, to make, you as, um, no, the, the UN and, and the international organization have a kind of um, best practices, but we have to change more. Mm. Change, in terms of um, women, women violence, for yeah. example, we have laws, but we are in a in a huge crisis of women violence against uh, uh, violence against women, and we still do more in the formal area in all the framework. Mm -hmm. I'm totally agree about you, but we need to put that things that we have in, in, in the laws, in, in the practice. Mm. Because in, in most of the cases, um, women movement fight a lot for new laws and, and, and it's necessary. But then we expect that the laws at itself change the reality. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and we don't see that. We, exactly. we, we need to work in, in, the, in the field. We need to use the law, that we work a lot for the law, and then it is, it is words. And th that's why I totally agree that we have to, to change all the laws, because the laws, most of the laws don't have women perspective. Mm -hmm. 
only the new the new ones, but mm -hmm. also we have to make something different to work to work faster than we are working now. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I want to uh, open up the floor for some questions, if you don't mind. Um, so, please. A mic is coming to you. So, my name is Alisar Nasser. I'm uh, in academia and education. You touched on education and its importance. And one of the struggles we have, if you want, in education is we often don't have enough in our curricula yes, yes. to encourage girls to think of themselves outside of what the stereotypes dictate. So we take it on our, upon ourselves as women in education to do that on behalf of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. It ends up working with, with some of the girls, but what does it do for the boys? Mm -hmm. So the boys in education, they don't have a, even close to enough of what they need to learn about making women their role models, not just men their role models. And so my question to you is, how do you see us who are on the ground in education? What can we do when we are just voices down there, but we cannot actually in, impact change without personal interference. Mm -hmm. It is not general interference, it's personal interference. I, I think that we need to, to share more the, um, the research and the knowledge about know-how to deal with, uh, with, with the education to change the stereotypes between men and, and women and to work with, as you say, with boys and girls. And uh, this is a step that we have to deal in the education faculties in the university also, because we cannot change education if we don't change the teachers, if we, if we don't give them the specific tools that they need to make the change in the ground. And, but, but we have a, a lot of knowledge that we can use because we, we go into the first step. We have the, the knowledge, but we don't know, uh, we don't use it as a tool in all the areas, a specific in education. We have to re-educate the teachers for make their change and to have their, the tools that you need in the ground. And I think that this is a, a, a kind of um, network between academia and uh, education as, a, as the, the, the education programs in, in primary and secondary schools. We need to make that bridge between the knowledge and, and you as teacher. Hmm. Absolutely, I think, uh, you know, we always talk about what would, what would it mean if our curriculums became gender responsive? And I think uh, Her Excellency, um, the Vice President is gonna come back for a session called Visions and Journeys. And I want you to tell the story of how you removed the very derogatory, popular story from the <laughs> yes. curriculum. I think that's a story worth telling. So please join us back and hear about that. Um, uh, Your Excellency Stella, do you have, would you want to share anything on this question? 
Um, I actually, uh, I, I don't know, uh, and I cannot see uh, what the, who the, the who who asked the question. But I would like to say, or at least what came to my mind when I listened to the question, and I, which this is a, 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 a substantial problem and a challenge. I would like to say, of course, that is at the end of the day something that we all work in. Uh, uh, whether it is from the EU or from Ireland or from other countries, but we are, of course, also in the international business because we're here to help. Uh, so if uh, you know, there is a concrete um, uh, uh, way of uh, sort of sharing uh, the knowledge that I have with uh, the, the person who asked the question, you know, please do uh, contact, uh, do uh, reach out. I mean, we are uh, in this business of international relations and foreign affairs and 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 development cooperation. So, um, do let me know if there is anything uh, that you think that the EU can do in this particular regard. I would uh, be happy to look into that. Thank you, Stella. I think uh, the EU does uh, great work. Um, in Costa Rica, we have a, a, a small a program that is a program of affectivity and sensibility who, who works with um, stereotypes in school and in secondary school, in primary and secondary school, to learn the boys and women, which is the new roles to be human, only human. Mm. And we can share with you the program. It's a new program mm. since 19, since 2017, 18. There has a lot of discussion in the country about that, about the program, as if, if it's needed or not. But mm. that this, is, this is one approach of that that you ask. Yeah. Finally, um your Excellency Sonia, I know Ireland has a huge ODA program. Mm -hmm. Are there any specific, do you, is your ODA program gender responsive? Yes, yeah, it is. I mean, one of our, we have four pillars in our development cooperation program and one of them is, is gender okay. equality. And again, we also have it mainstreamed throughout the, the program. But I think it's, your point I think really goes back to what we were talking about earlier that there's attitudinal change, but there's also structural change. So you're obviously leading the way in changes of attitudes, but then you also need the structural change that the curriculum needs to, needs to respond to that. And it's funny, actually, my mother worked in education all her career, and she was, in Ireland, we had very traditional gender roles in 60s, 70s, up to the 80s, 90s even. And she was on a board in Ireland looking at curriculum um, development. And one of the ways that in Ireland we learn our native language, Gaelic, is through these books, and it always has Mummy in the kitchen and daddy mm -hmm. out at work yes. and Jane helping in the kitchen with mummy and Peter Lola. helping his <laughs> and she was actually saying this that if we want to you know this is this was the conversation was about teaching Irish Gaelic but she was also bringing in the point that actually if we want to teach kids Irish like let's let's also change the gender stereotypes in the in the books and everyone else was looking at her going, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and this was in the late 1980s, you know, so it's, I think every country has gone through this. Every country okay. has gone through that transformation or is in some stage of the journey, let's say, in mm. terms of the transformation of, of their curriculum and what they teach in schools and how they teach in schools. So I think, yeah, that sharing information mm -hmm. and what you're talking about on, on Costa Rica sounds amazing that you have this specific mm -hmm. curriculum around attitudes so that you actually look at those things and that women, boys and girls have to look at it and understand it and discuss it and think about it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have come to the end of mm -hmm. this panel. I want to thank you all for your wonderful contributions. You've really got me thinking about things. Um, I think that you have inspired our audience, educated us all on what needs to be done. Uh, we could have continued this conversation for a couple of more hours. <laughs> um, but I am very grateful for you uh, being here. I think we'll have to stop now so we can take, so we can welcome Her Excellency Helen Clark to this portion of the discussion. Please, everybody, give them a round of applause.
Thank you. It's not over. We have the amazing Helen Clark with us, who's going to join us in a minute or two virtually. Um, so please do remain in your seats. We're going to continue the discussion. And when are we doing the vision and journey? It's going to be on the 19th. On the 19th. Tomorrow, 4.30 p.m. Uh, yes, that's right. So I want to let you all know that we have the honor and the pleasure to welcome Her Excellency Epsi Campbell again tomorrow to hear more on what her vision for a gender future looks like and what her journey has been. And she's somebody that is really amazing. She is the first woman in a position like this of Afro descent uh, to, to ever be in a, in a vice president position across all of the Americas. Kamala Harris came after, <laughs> so, um, so I think it's really a treat that we have women of such uh, statures with us and we're really honored, so please do come back. It's going to be an intimate conversation with Her Excellency. So now we're moving on and we're really honored to welcome the Right Honorable Helen Clark virtually for a quick fireside chat discussion to conclude our event. Um, Her Excellency Helen Clark was Prime Minister of New Zealand from 1999 to 2008. Hello, Your Excellency. It looks so pristine where you are. I thought it was a photo. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is a photo <laughs> of, of Auckland Harbour. <laughs> welcome, welcome. It is such an honor and a pleasure to have you here. You are someone who has been widely engaged in, in policy development across so many areas, whether on an international, economic, social, environmental uh, level. Uh, you are someone who has been... Um, very much involved uh, during my time as the, at the UN. We used to look up to you, wait for you to speak, to hear what you had to say as administrator of uh, UNDP, which you held for about eight years. Uh, today, Her Excellency continues to be a voice for sustainable development, climate action, gender equality, women's leadership, peace and justice, and most recently appointed by the Director General of the World Health Organization as a co-chair for the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response. Please join me in giving her a warm uh, round of applause to welcome her. Um, Your Excellency, it's, it's really such a pleasure to have you. Um, we have been having a discussion on the issue of SDG 5 being the mother of all SDGs. Without SDG 5, we don't even have a chance of implementing the 16 other goals that we have um, on, in front of us. Um, so I want to ask for an overview from you. Where do you think we are in 
the global develop uh, the the global agenda for sustainable development. Uh, where do you think the biggest gaps are? What's holding us back? We had a long discussion on the need, uh, on, on the necessity of normative legislative frameworks, on how important that is, but also on tackling the stereotypes that still plague us. So I know I, I, I said a lot in the sentence, but let's break it down. Uh, where do you think we are and what do you think are the most challenging barriers in front of us? Well, you're right that if we can't achieve SDG 5, we can't achieve the SDGs because if you leave women behind uh, where they have you know, less access to healthcare, less access to education, are more numerous among the extremely poor, the hungry. Uh, you, you just can't make make progress. And turn that round. If, if women are fully you know, part of the story, it, it's a it's a it's a right for women uh, to enjoy equality. But it's also you know, hugely important for societies, families, whole economies uh, that women uh, are enabled, capacitated, supported to, to take this, this this equal place. So before the pandemic, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, including this one, uh, were in a, a bit of trouble, and the pandemic just made it so much more more challenging. I think we need to see the Sustainable Development Goals actually as offering a pathway uh, for recovery from the pandemic. We need to get back to the goal, get the the uh, the focus on them. No no need to re reinvent the wheel all the time with the development agendas. I welcome the fact that the Secretary General of the UN, in his uh, common uh, agenda report uh, released uh, last year, uh, has uh, suggested that a social development summit uh, be held in, in 2025. That would be 30 years after the one in, in, in Copenhagen from, from recollection. Uh, and that would enable us to focus particularly on the, the human development goals of the SDGs, uh, poverty, hunger, gender equality, universal health coverage, sex and reproductive health and rights, uh, education, there are just so many things that are falling behind uh, at, at the moment. So the, the last mile on the SDGs was long already. It, it got longer as the impacts of COVID added to the numbers you know, being left behind in, in poverty and hunger and out of school and you know, the, 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 the long list. But you know, there are ways out of this. And it's going to depend on, on international solidarity. I also think that we should emphasize getting more women's voices into leadership and decision-making positions. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, the proportion of, of women parliamentarians, for example, around the world is pathetically low. It reminds me of my relative, the early days in New Zealand politics. I was one of 9% when I entered New Zealand politics, 9% women in the parliament. These days it's almost 50%. But, you know, we, we have to keep pushing this because out of sight is out of mind. You know, decisions yeah. shouldn't be made about women. Women have to be part of the decisions. And I think that getting a focus on the things that are most important to women does mean getting women's voices at, at the top tables, and I, I really want to underline that. Absolutely. Um, part of the discussion we have been having, and uh, you know, we here at the Women's Pavilion, our whole exhibition uh, is under the title of New Perspectives. When women thrive, humanity thrives. And we recognize that SDGs are indivisible. Uh, we recognize that mainstreaming is, is absolutely necessary in everything that we do. Um, like you said, we need to keep pushing. Out of sight does become out of mind. Um, but one thing that has been sort of gnawing at me and my team is when we, when we think of all these frameworks that we have, and we have had them for a very long time. Started with Beijing, uh, we built upon that. Uh, we have CSW every year. But progress, and especially the pandemic, demonstrated how progress is so fragile and can be rolled back 
so quickly and so easily. Violence against women rose up and became the shadow pandemic. How could we in 2020 still have or possess a mindset that allows for such atrocities, you know? And so for us, it really, it, the question became, when we know what to do on a legislative level, when we know what to do on investment level, when we know what to do on a capacity building level, what is the problem? It must be a perspective it must be a mindset that is negative, that is not inclusive of women. And so part of the discussion we've just had with our previous speakers was how do we tackle invisible barriers, negative social norms, and is that part of the main problem that we're facing in not achieving SDG 5 and subsequently the rest of the SDGs? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, my observation would be that the more progress we make, the more fierce the, the backlash becomes. Mm. Because let's face it, for women to get their fair share of, of positions and employment, their fair share of resources and opportunity. And some men will see this as a zero-sum game where they lose out, which is, of course, ridiculous because, as you said, humanity benefits when, when women are enabled, capacitated to, to have a, you know, a genuine equality. But I think we are going through this period of, of, of backlash. You know, you mentioned Beijing. We had three major UN world conferences on women before that started, as mm. I recall, in, in Mexico City in 75. Then there was Copenhagen. In 1985, I was in the New, New Zealand delegation as a young member of parliament, uh, which went to Nairobi uh, for the uh, UN conference on, on women then. And the politics were tough then, by the way. Uh, then Beijing set, you know, this, this landmark declaration. But, you know, Beijing was a long time ago. And yeah. so great is the background that the general view of the UN when I was, was there, and this view in the end prevailed, was that you couldn't run the risk of trying to convene a Beijing plus 25 conference because you might go backwards yeah. from the Beijing uh, uh, program of action. Now, now, this is ridiculous because Beijing is outdated. You know, there's, there's new issues. You know, was Beijing talking about intersectionality? Was it talking about all, all sorts of things that have, that have come along the last... 25 years as, as important uh, priorities. So, so we needed a new Beijing and we couldn't have one because we might have gone uh, backwards. I've also noted the, the really often very nasty atmosphere that develops around the Commission on the Status of Women meetings. I think it was last year that uh, you know one of the very senior diplomats trying to chair unruly proceedings was reduced to tears by the attacks that came on her. This is a Completely unacceptable, uh, obviously. Um, you, you're, you're right. Progress is, is fragile, and the closer we get, the harder uh, the forces of resistance will, will fight back. I mean, how extraordinary to see um, in among the countries that were, have been signatories to the Istanbul uh, Convention uh, covering uh, issues related to uh, violence against women, that Turkey is withdrawing from the convention which was, you know, formulated in, in, in Istanbul. So you know, we, we live in strange times. Now, I think we need to take to heart uh, the, the framing that UN Women had around its Beijing plus 25 events, and it was around generation equality, mm -hmm. and it was about reaching across the generations uh, so that the energy insights, perspectives of younger women uh, could be bridged with those of, you know, perhaps the, the women of my age and older who, who fought so many battles. Um, and we need to come together uh, generations across the, you know, the, the, the rich diversity of women, the intersectionality, uh, so that we can tackle these issues together. And we can't go away into a corner quietly. We have to be on the front foot to say, we've got this far, not far enough, and we, we, we have to push on, and we'll only do it 
if, if, if we join hands, you know, in, in our own countries and, and, and around the world to do that. We should be an unstoppable uh, force and not be thwarted by these obstacles that are being thrown up. Absolutely. And I think uh, this is one of the points that was made by the vice president of Costa Rica, who was on the previous panel, that, you know, we need these alliances. We need everybody to come on board, and certainly the younger generation and uh, the older generation, uh, you know, needs to be in conversations with each other to to push on. Um, mm. You know, I'm I'm going to uh, take a risk here and and ask you, what else? What else do we need to do? Because for me, you know, th there has to be something that we can do better. Intergenerational dialogues, alliances, these are all important. This is what we plan, you know, for us at Expo and International Women's Day. We're actually working with New Zealand to host a session where young women will come and the baton of the older generations will be passed on to them. But what is that yeah. silver bullet, perhaps, that we are still not seeing? Is there one, in your view? Yeah. What could you help us see? Well, I, I think th there's two that I would uh, specify. One, again, I, I'd really underline the importance of getting women at the decision-making table. Now, sure, no, not, not every woman who gets to that table may necessarily be the, the greatest advocate for gender equality, but most will be, right? Mm. Most will be because, uh, you know, we – that, that – that's just going to be the going to be the case in my observation. Uh, but secondly, I I think um, that the rallying and supporting of young women to come forward and fight on these issues is is absolutely critical. And my my observation would be looking at my own country's experience was that. Uh, I mean, we we went through a period in New Zealand where just about every top position was held by women. Uh, it was the, the PM, the, the Governor General, the, the, the Chief Justice, the Speaker of Parliament, the Attorney General, the head of the biggest company, the head of the medical association, the accountants, the lawyers, you name it, women held mm. everything. And that, that can actually slide quite fast <laughs> if, it, if it's just, you know, a sort of particular a moment of time. And, and the key thing is to have... A, a critical mass of, of women mm. you know, really you know, aiming to get to that 50% uh, across all, all areas of, of, of public life and company boards and, and decision-making and education and health, wherever it is. Um, but we're going to have to fight for that because a lot of the barriers are still there for younger women coming up. Uh, you know, is childcare affordable and, and yeah. accessible? You know, what, what, what about the support for, you know, in, in general for women who want to combine home and family? Now, you know, of yeah. course, men should be taking this responsibility as well. But, you know, happy days. We, we all work for this and we, we all know enlightened young men who do, do play that role. But they, they tend to be the minority, un, unfortunately. Uh, so, so women carry a lot on their shoulders with respect to family for the care of... Absolutely. Um, older relatives, relatives with disabilities, children. We need more uh, sharing within the families uh, of, of, of these roles, and we need the, the social systems to be supportive mm. uh, of, of, of those who need, who need care, which, which currently falls disproportionately on women. Women do about three-quarters of the world's unpaid work, by the way. I mean, it can be shown that we, we, you know, we're trying to juggle a lot of things a, a, yeah. alongside paid employment and so on. So, yeah, I, I think uh, younger women perhaps felt that the job had been done in, in a number of our societies where women are real top, top positions, but actually the job hadn't been done. We have to keep fighting uh, for, for better conditions and, and, and genuine opportunity for women. Yeah, absolutely. Your Excellency, I think uh, I don't want to take more of your time, and I think we've reached the end. Um, I want to allow for one question, if your time allows. 
from the audience. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Matilda. I'm 22. I just finished my master's in engineering. So I'm a part of the generation where I was allowed to dream to be a woman in engineering. And as we were discussing before, I think one of the hardest things of growing up was realizing that frustration that we're not there yet. And I'm just about to start my career, and I would love to hear what your advice is to maybe your 22-year-old self and myself of how to not give up hope and how to keep that strength to really make that vision of true equality happen. Well, well, firstly, uh, congratulations, because engineering has been one of the, you know, the toughest disciplines for women to crack uh, into. Uh, I, I was uh, invited by the, the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering at Auckland University to speak to students there uh, a, cu a couple of two or three years ago. And I, I recall that probably about 20% of the students were, were female and that they had you know, targets for 30%, but nowhere near 50. So you know, this is a profession where you can make a difference in encouraging, supporting other women to come into the profession. You know, the, the you know, uh, in encouraging the engineering faculties, the engineering companies to you know, go to the girls' schools, encourage the girls to come forward uh, where they have the aptitudes with, with, with maths and, and sciences to, to get into this you know, very, very interesting profession. And, and isn't this another issue, that often girls in their career choices are dropping the STEM subjects, which make it possible to pursue the sort of career that you're pursuing. So look, you, you're over the first hurdle. You, you're there. You've got the master's degree. You're stepping out into the, into the world. And what I would say to you is when, when you see a vacant slot that's, that's well within your competency, you go for it. You say, my name's on that chair. I, I believe in myself and my capacity to do it. The general rule of thumb is that uh, women who are you know, 120% qualified for something will often say, oh, no, not me, I'm not ready yet. Whereas men who are 60% qualified will say, I've got this, you know. <laughs> so we have to believe in ourselves, put ourselves forward, you know, do the work to justify our self-confidence but definitely be self-confident. That, that's the advice I would give to my 22-year-old uh, self and, and which I give to you. Your Excellency, thank you so much. You are someone I look up to. You are inspirational. Um, I wish we could have had you here at Expo. Maybe for International Women's Day, you'll join us. Um, for now, I really want to extend my deepest appreciation to you for joining us today, for your advice, for your words of wisdom. And I think with that, we will conclude. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that's a wrap, everybody. <laughs>